All right, so we're going to start at the beginning uh, uh, with our uh, fairly famous ABYC depiction of the Ohms guys. Uh, these guys represent the, the three uh, primary components or principles of the electricity that we deal with. Uh, we have volts, uh, we have ohms, and we have amps. So you can consider electricity, electricity uh, in a very basic way uh, in terms of water in a hose. Uh, the voltage is the pressure, uh, sometimes referred to it as the potential. Uh, the amps, uh, you can think of that as the rate of flow, uh, and the resistance is the factors that are trying to slow down that rate of flow. Uh, the resistance is our own uh, specification. Uh, so, that, you know, it also this diagram also depicts uh, how these three uh, entities interact with each other. Uh, you have the, the volts trying to push the amperage through the wire, uh, and the ohms there, the resistance. Uh, any place there is resistance is going to slow that ohms down through its travel. So our relationship between those three entities, resistance in ohms, current in amps, and voltage in volts, of course, uh, there are uh, mathematical certainties. Uh, if resistance increases, the current decreases. Uh, if voltage increases, there's going to be an increase in current flow. Uh, these are givens. Uh, in all circuits, uh, voltage is lost as it travels through the circuit, uh, and all of these relationships are examples of what we call what is known as Ohm's Law. Uh, so we're not going to get into the specific deep theory here, uh, but Ohm's Law and uh, the power equation, which we're also going to discuss in a second, uh, very useful uh, tools, mainly to understand the relationship of how one of these aspects affects the other. Uh, Ohm's Law states that if you know any two of those three values, you can always calculate the third by multiplying or dividing. So simple terms to find out voltage, uh, you multiply amps times uh, resistance, ohms. Uh, if you want to find out amps, you divide volts by resistance, or if you want to find out the resistance, you divide volts by amps. Uh, now, Ohm's law doesn't come into play uh, in your everyday mathematical uh, troubleshooting or, or installation work. Um, again, it, it more gives you an idea of what the relationship is between uh, those three entities. So as an example, we normally have 12 volts uh, in a system. If we can measure the current, the amperage flow at four amps, divide the volts by the amps, and we get three ohms of resistance. Um, conversely, if we know that the voltage is 12 uh, and the resistance is three, we get four amps. Uh, very easy mathematical equations to see how those entities affect one another. Uh, the power equation is a much more useful uh, equation uh, information on, on a daily basis, on a regular basis for things you need to figure out in your uh, uh, electrical uh, meanderings. Um, the power equation expresses the relationship among potential, again, volts, current, and amperage. And this time, instead of resistance, we're putting in a power factor, which is measured in watts. Uh, equation works exactly the same way as Ohm's law. Uh, if you're given any two, you can measure two, you can find out the third. Uh, so to find out the power, the watts, multiply volts times amps. Uh, if you want to know the voltage, divide watts by amps. If you want to know amperage, divide the watt watts by volts. Uh, this equation is very useful because the ABYC standard E11 requires all manufacturers uh, to label their equipment with values for potential voltage and current or power. So on this microwave label, uh, power is listed at 1.2 kilowatts, uh, and the voltage is 120 volts. Uh, to find the current, we're looking for the amperage. We're going to convert that 1.2 kilowatts to 1,200 watts. Uh, 1,000 kilowatts is one watt. Uh, so 1,200 watts, sorry, other way around, one kilowatt, 1,000 watts. Uh, then divide the 1,200 watts by 120 volts, and that tells us we have a 10-amp draw from the microwave. Uh, it's it's very easy to do, and that's uh, again practical application when you need to figure out overcurrent protection or wire sizing uh, for an appliance for any any component. Um, if, you, if you can't, if you're not given what the amperage draw is, that's how you can figure out what you need to to deal with. Uh, and there should always be at least two of those needed values listed on any equipment, AC or DC. Um, and but before applying the power equation, we want to uh, important to determine factors such as the correct wire size, 
uh, and the rating for overcurrent protective devices. So that brings us to our trivia question of the day that has a prize. Uh, we want to know uh, what is the main thing that the terms volts, amps, ohms, and watts all have in common? Uh, you can all put in uh, answers, all the correct answers we get. Uh, one person will be chosen from those correct answers and you've received a spiffy new ABYC t-shirt. So uh, give it your best shot. Uh, and again, this is gonna be recorded later. So uh, this only pertains to the live broadcast. And, and Mike, just to jump in, yeah, you can put your questions. If you're gonna answer that, uh, put it right in the question column and I'll be compiling that. And like I said, we'll, we'll pull a name from the hat uh, of the right answers. All right, great, Dave, thanks. Uh, so let's move a little further into uh, the complexity of our electrical systems and identify the components that we have in our electrical circuits. Um, we're going to have a power source. Uh, in this drawing, it's a battery. In AC, it's going to be our shore power. Uh, we have our conductors, uh, which is our wiring connecting all of our components. We've got uh, an overcurrent protection device, hopefully, if it's installed correctly, to ABYC standards, uh, which is our circuit breaker uh, or fuses. Uh, we've got a switch uh, to control the load, uh, which sometimes can just be that uh, that breaker, if it is a switchable breaker. Uh, and we have the load, in this case, a cabin light. The cabin light, uh, the load is the, is the resistance in the circuit. Um, it's our component that the circuit is there to provide power to. Uh, and at the end, we've got to have a return path to ground. Uh, if we do not have that return path to ground, nothing is going to work. In order for current to flow, you have to have a complete circuit. So proper conductor sizing is important for several reasons. Uh, we need to ensure that we're not gonna exceed the wire's thermal limit uh, that it's rated for, uh, that it can adequately handle the amperage draw requirement that we're gonna ask it to handle. Uh, and for DC conductors, uh, that that wire does not exceed the voltage drop limits prescribed in standard E11, which we will uh, address shortly. So in sizing AC wire, um, we're going to use one of several tables found within standard E11. Uh, there are uh, this one, table 3.7, which gives us the maximum allowable amperage of a single AC, and in this case also DC conductor, uh, that is not bundled, sheathed, or in a, con in a conduit. Uh, table 3.8, uh, gives us allowable amperages when we have up to three current carrying conductors that are bundled, sheath, or in a conduit. Uh, there are three additional tables, which you don't necessarily have to worry about, uh, just to understand that they're there and why they're being mentioned. Uh, they further derate the current carrying capacity of AC wiring, uh, but they no longer apply to DC conductors. Um, it is felt that uh, there is sufficient derating of our DC conductor ampacities uh, through table 3.8, which is for three current carrying conductors, even if we uh, add uh, further wires to that bundle. Uh, and what we're going to look at here, I want to just take notice. Uh, if you get my pointer. So this is for. Um, Single, single conductor. So if we look at 10 gauge uh, and we go over to the 105C column. Now, whenever you reference this, you will normally be referencing the 105C. That is the conductor insulation rating. Uh, and all marine cable, basically all marine cable, if you're, if you're buying the right stuff, is rated for 105C. Uh, per the standards, 60C is for outside engine spaces, which is why it says it's not permitted for inside engine spaces. Uh, and 75C is the minimum for inside engine spaces. Uh, but if you buy proper marine cable, it will almost always be rated at 105C. So our 10 gauge wire, we come over to 105C, outside an engine space says we can put 60 amps through that piece of 10 gauge wire. Uh, inside an engine space, we can put 51 amps through that piece of wire. If we go to table 3.8, which is for up to three current carrying conductors, use our same 10 gauge, go over to one of the 105C cable. Now you can see because we've added two other current carrying conductors, we're now only allowed to put 42 amps instead of 60 uh, through the uh, wire and outside end spaces and only 35 amps 
inside empty spaces. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, those subsequent tables that I mentioned, uh, the more you add together, the, the lower this number is going to go uh, for the amount of amperage that you can run through that wire with it being included with many other cables. Uh, so when we use the derating cables, the current carrying conductors that they're talking about, we do not count the grounding conductor. We do not count the green uh, because it is normally not current carrying and therefore will normally not generate any heat. Uh, the main points to consider uh, are whether or not the wire run goes through an engine room space, uh, what the engine insulation temperature rating and the amperage handling requirements are. Uh, if any part of that wire run goes through an engine space, it has to be rated to the lower engine space rating. Uh, if you run from one end of the boat to the other and it's only in the engine space for a third of that length, you've got to rate it for the engine space rating. Uh, and voltage drop. Uh, voltage drop is mainly a DC issue, which we'll see. Uh, as we mentioned before, in all circuits, some voltage is lost as it travels through the circuit and is referred to simply as voltage drop. Um, for AC conductors, we are concerned mostly about heat buildup. Uh, and that is the uh, crux of our derating uh, system uh, for the conductors based on the wire itself and how many wires are bundled together. Um, in our applications, voltage drop is not considered. Uh, with AC because the length of the wire runs for AC circuits found on typical boats uh, is not considered long enough to be a significant factor for performance. Uh, it does occur with AC voltage over much longer distances, uh, but due to the higher potentials voltages that we're dealing with, 120, 240, even 480, uh, it is not a concern for wire runs of less than 100 feet. So anytime you hear voltage drop in our world, the marine world, you're talking about DC cabling. So for DC cabling, due to the fact that we have a comparatively low potential, our voltages are much lower. We're 1224 most of the time. Um, we've got to consider the following. Uh, what that nominal voltage is for the circuit in question, uh, the amount of amperage that we're asking the circuit to deal with, uh, and the total length of the circuit. Uh, so we have voltage drop tables to, uh, to deal with this issue. Uh, and these voltage drop tables are specified for either 3% voltage drop or 10% maximum voltage drop. And that depends upon the nature of the circuit. Um, it is very important to remember that when figuring the total circuit length, uh, the distance is from the source of power to the load in question, your device, and back to the source of power. Uh, you've got to consider that to establish the total length of the circuit. The length of the circuit is not from, is not the distance from the battery to the light uh, or the, the AC panel to whatever it goes to. It's twice that distance. You've got to calculate the entire loop, the entire circuit is the total circuit length. So conductors that are used for panel board or switchboard feeders, uh, bilge blowers, electronic equipment, navigation lights and other circuits where voltage drop has got to be kept to a minimum, that wire shall be sized for a voltage drop not to exceed 3%. And we'll see in a minute uh, what size wire we're talking about here to be able to accommodate that. Um, conductors used for lighting other than nav lights uh, in other circuits where voltage drop is not critical shall be sized for a voltage drop not to exceed 10%. So even in the cases we're not trying to hold that voltage drop to 3% for critical items, we don't want it to go over 10%. 10% voltage drop uh, for most electrical items is going to be an issue. It's just not going to work right. Uh, so for our cabin lights, fans, pumps, windlass, uh, all ancillary DC equipment, 10% um, is the most we want to see uh, on, that, on that wire. So on the tables themselves, uh, the circuit lengths are given across the top of the table in feet, uh, but they're only given in 10 foot increments beyond 30 feet. So if the length of the circuit you're dealing with is in between any of those numbers, always go to the next highest number. Use the next highest number as your reference. Uh, on the left hand side of the column, uh, the amperage values are listed and they're given in five amp increments up to 30 and then also in 10 amp increments. So if you're uh, amperage falls between some of those, one of those, or two of those, sorry, uh, 
uh, numbers, uh, you've got to go to the next highest one as your reference point. So in using the voltage drop table, the first thing you need to do is determine what kind of circuit you're working with. Do I need a 3% voltage drop or 10% voltage drop? And then you reference either the 3% or 10% volt drop table. So determine your actual wire length, the actual wire length from the source of power to the device and back. Uh, assign that value to the next highest distance given in feet across the top of the row of the table if it doesn't match one exactly or very closely within one foot. Uh, so use your amperage, the amperage that you need to uh, to deal with, uh, and is given on the is given on the left hand side of the column, and then again use the next highest number uh, to your actual value if you're in between numbers. So you want to slide across the page from your amperage number across to below your uh, uh, distance number. Uh, and the number you land on for proper wire gauge is going to be the proper wire gauge for that circuit. So on our 3% table, let's let's just deal with 20 amps. Uh, so 20 amps and say we've got a 50 amp circuit. That's 25 feet and 20, 25 feet back. For 20 amps on 50 feet for a 3 volt, 3% 3 volt drop, we've got to use a piece of number four cable. Uh, that's a fairly substantial piece of cable. Compared to our 10% volt drop table, 20 amps, 50 feet, we only need a piece of number 10. Uh, so you can see uh, there is quite a sizable difference in wiring uh, between 3% and 10%. Uh, conductors introduce electrical resistance. So some voltage drop is inevitable. Uh, you know, we can't have zero, zero voltage drop, but 3% is pretty close. Uh, general rule is amperage and wire length increase, so much the wire, much the wire size. Um, as you're using these tables, keep in mind, if you're not terribly familiar with wire gauges, the higher the wire gauge number, the smaller the diameter. Uh, there's an inverse relationship. So we can see our 14 gauge high number, very small cable. Uh, one gauge, low number, the very big cable. Uh, in the second column, we have zero gauge, uh, which is sometimes referred to as one aught. Uh, then we have zero, zero gauge, which can be written as two zeros or two slash zero, two aught, and then three aught and four aught. Uh, four aught is, is on the large side of what we typically run into uh, in our, our DC cable, uh, but you can go larger than that with the circular mill cable uh, if necessary. 